Uh, next up, uh, we're very fortunate to be joined by John Hilsenrath. We'll talk about the role of the Federal Reserve as lender of uh, last resort during the um, financial crisis. Uh, John is the global economics editor for the Wall Street Journal, where he has worked since 1997, working in Hong Kong, New York, and Washington. John is focused on the causes and consequences of global financial crises. He was a Pulitzer Prize finalist in 2014 for his coverage of the Federal Reserve, part of a Wall Street Journal team that was Pulitzer finalist in 2009 for coverage of the financial crisis and contributed on the ground reporting to the Wall Street Journal's 9-11 coverage, which won a Pulitzer in 2002. His stories also have been honored by the Society of Publishers in Asia, Columbia University, the Society of Business Editors and Writers, the Deadline Club, the Institute on Political Journalism, and others. His colleagues in journalism have voted John twice among the nation's most influential financial journalists. He's graduated from Duke University in 1989 and was a Knight Bachelor Fellow and MBA graduate from Columbia, Columbia Business School in 1996. John, welcome. Uh, thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, you've probably seen a bunch of PowerPoint presentations today, like Emma's, which was great. I'm, I'm going low tech. I uh, have been writing about finance for uh, 20 plus years, and I've written down a bunch of thoughts, and I'm going to stick pretty close to my script. Um, the subject of the conver of the the talk today is lenders of last resort and um, central banks. I covered the Fed during the the last financial crisis. Uh, I actually started the job uh, moving down to Washington from New York the week that Lehman Brothers blew up. Uh, so it was quite a, quite a trial by fire. Uh, what, what I want to do today is talk about three writers, actually, uh, three economics writers who've shaped the way we think about financial crises. Uh, two of these writers I got to, I've gotten to know as a journalist and uh, one uh, died uh, many, many years ago. The first is Charles Kindleberger. Uh, he was an MIT economist who wrote a book called Mania's Panics and Crashes. Uh, if you haven't read it, then uh, I'd recommend that you do. It chronicled bubbles and busts going all the way back to the Dutch tulip bubble, which, uh, which Emma talked about, uh, which took place in 1636. One of my favorite anecdotes in this book was uh, a footnote that explained that a single viceroy tulip bulb uh, back at the time commanded a down payment, just a down payment, of eight pigs, a dozen sheep, a thousand pounds of cheese, a bed, a silver beaker, and four tons of butter. Uh, so I think that puts some, some perspective uh, what a bubble looked like four or five hundred years ago. I visited Kindleberger uh, in a retirement community outside of Boston in 2002 to talk to him about the tech stock crash. Uh, the forward in the third edition of his book, which was released in 1996, warned of a bubble brewing in technology stocks. And his former colleague uh, at the time, Paul Samuelson, who won a Nobel Prize and ran the MIT economics department, warned saying someone in the next sometime in the next five years you might kick yourself for not reading and rereading Kindleberger's Manias, Panics and Crashes. At the time in ninety six, uh, the tech crash was more than four years away. Kindleberger's own personal funds uh, had been parked in CDs, money market funds and bonds. So he averted this crash. And he told me uh, as I sat with him in this retirement community with a glint in his eye that he was experiencing a bit of schadenfreude, a pleasure in the misfortune of other people. He was, he was 91 years old at the time, uh, and he was very hard of hearing, which meant my interview with him went on for hours to make sure I understood what he was saying. But his rule of thumb at the age of 91 was that, in, you might want to carry this with you over time, that investors should tr subtract their age from 100, uh, and that's how much you should have in stocks. So at 91, he was pretty safe. Uh, he didn't get exposed to that tech bubble. Having predicted the tech bust, Kindleberger was collecting newspaper clippings at the time uh, in his uh, personal office at this retirement community about the US real estate market. Uh, Emma noted that we had prices booming uh, in places like California and Florida as early as 1992. And he told me he wasn't certain there was a bubble yet, but he suspected that one was brewing. He said that if he were 30 years younger, uh, he'd be writing a book about two companies, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Uh, here's his quote that I put in the story. Banks make a mortgage and sell it to them. It means the banks are ready to mortgage more and more and more and more and more. 
It's dangerous, I think. Uh, Fannie Mae, I called a Fannie Mae spokesman for comment, uh, and Fannie Mae told me that his worries were preposterous. Uh, Kindleberger died before he could see Fannie and Freddie get bailed out in the summer of 2008 as part of the worst financial crisis in modern times. So why am I raising him now? Well, uh, Kindleberger dedicated a great deal of his time in his book, Manias, Panics, and Crashes, and in my meeting with him talking about the role of central banks in financial crises and what economists call lenders of last resort. So uh, since that's the subject of today's talk, I thought I should reflect on what Kindleberger said about that uh, subject. Uh, now, the economy's modest response to the tech bubble uh, was in part due to the Fed's decisions, the Federal Reserve's decisions to cut interest rates in response to the crisis. Kindleberger credit out, credited Alan Greenspan, who was the uh, Fed chairman at the time, for doing a good job in that instance. But he told me he wasn't sure the Fed was up to the task of dealing with a boom in home equity loans that he saw building up among households as part of the emerging housing boom. Now, the, the other important thing, I think, to talk about with respect to the tech boom is that it wasn't so much a debt-driven boom, uh, but many bubbles were, and those were the ones that were especially dangerous. And this is a critical lesson in history and something that, that Emma talked, on, talked about. It was the central bank's job to keep credit-driven busts from feeding on themselves, uh, but it's a complicated task. And here's what Kindleberger said about it, about the challenge in his book. Uh, the lender of last resort stands ready to halt a run of real assets and illiquid financial assets into money by supplying as much money as may be necessary to forestall the run. The concept is of an elastic supply of money that expands to meet demand in panics. How much money? To whom? On what terms? When? These questions are, are faced by the lender of last resort and follow from the dilemma that if investors believe uh, that banks and perhaps other selected borrowers will be supported in moments of distress by a lender of last resort, they'll be less cautious about the extension of loans during the next boom. I think this becomes a really important issue going from the tech bubble uh, to the housing bubble just a few years later. The public good, uh, Kindleberger said, of the, of the lender of last resort weakens the responsibility of private lenders to ensure that they make sound loans. If, however, in a panic, the rush from the sale of securities and commodities into money can't be halted, the fallacy of composition takes center stage. The sale of these assets by investors in the effort to minimize losses leads to declines in the asset prices, with the consequence that a large number of the otherwise previous solvent and well-capitalized firms may become bankrupt. So what was Kindleberger saying? He was saying that if, if the lender of last resort lends too much, uh, the central banker creates what's known in uh, economics as moral hazard, a sense of irresponsibility in the private sector driven by an assurance of a bailout some, someplace down the road. If they lend too little and a crisis tumbles into a downward spiral in which investors and lenders sell assets, pushing down their value and making it harder to pay off the loans against which those assets serve as collateral in the first place, in that scenario, Healthy banks and healthy lenders follow unhealthy ones into bankruptcy. Kindleberger noted uh, in his book that opposition to lenders of last resort is as perennial as financial crises themselves. And this comes up again after the last financial crisis. People often argue that banks that mess up should be made to pay for their own mistakes, to flush the system of miscreants and excesses. It's known as the liquidationist theory. It goes all the way back to the 1800s. And it included people like Napoleon's minister of finance, a man named Francois Moyen, who opposed his boss's desire to bail out manufacturers in a crisis in 1848. I want to unpack, uh, unpack all of this talk about lenders of last resort and banking crises a little bit by talking uh, for a few months, moments about the origins and history of central banking here in the United States. So our founding fathers uh, fought fiercely over the creation of our first national bank. Alexander Hamilton was a New Yorker and the nation's first treasury secretary. Uh, and if you want a history on this, you could pay a few hundred dollars and go see Hamilton the Musical, which gets into this uh, in rap, which I was thinking about doing for you and decided not to. Uh, but uh, he wanted a national bank to manage the currency and national debts and to unify uh, 
uh, the nation. Thomas Jefferson was a Virginia farmer. He distrusted banks deeply. He distrusted New Yorkers, meaning Hamilton, and he distrusted federal power. And so they fought fiercely over whether we should create the, the country should create a national bank as part of its founding. Hamilton won the battle. He convinced George Washington and Congress to create the first national bank of the United States. But he lost the war when Andrew Jackson came along a couple decades later. He also distrusted banks. He was also uh, from outside of the uh, big metro areas on the East Coast. And he shut down the second national bank in 1836. By the way, he also was a fierce opponent of paper money. And I've always found it amazing that he sits on our $20 bill. Um, <laughs> Washington and all its wisdom, uh, the Treasury Department had a, kind of dis a discussion a few years ago about placing a woman on, uh, on a piece of paper currency, because it's all white men on paper currency. They decided initially to do that, but to replace Hamilton, who was the father of the central bank and the modern currency, uh, on the $10 bill and leave Jackson on the $20 bill. But they changed their minds. I think it's going to go a different way. Uh, anyway, with the end of the Second National Bank in 1836, the U.S. went 77 years without any institution to turn to when a crisis struck. This made the country prone to bank runs. And I want to talk a little bit about what banks are and what bank runs are all about. So in very simple terms, banks take demand deposits and other short-term deposits, money that people pretty much expect to get back when they ask for it on demand. <laughs> Uh, think about the, the movie, It's a Wonderful Life, and the people who leave their money on deposit at uh, George Bailey's bank uh, and want it back uh, on a moment's notice. Well, the banks take this money, the short-term money, uh, and they invest it in longer-run assets. So that was railroad uh, loans and canal loans in the 1800s. It was commercial real estate or residential mortgages in the 1980s and 2000s. And now, economists call this uh, trans what happens when a bank takes a short-term loan and uses the money to buy a long-term asset. They call it maturity transformation. And the point of it is that you pay off a, a lower interest rate on your short-term loan, but you earn a higher return on your long-term asset, and you earn a profit on the margin. The bridge between the short-term loan and the long-term asset is trust. And when we have a bank run, the trust, that bridge breaks. So in a bank run, people who deposit their money at a bank get worried that they won't get their money back because of some sign of instability around the bank, such as doubts about, whether, about the health of its loan portfolio. Many people come to the bank like they did at George Bailey in uh, This uh, Wonderful Life, and they ask for their money back right away. But the money is tied up in long-term assets that bank can't access. The banks can't asset, access right away. So they need to scramble to get the money, sometimes by selling the assets that they, they hold to someone else. And that pushes down the prices of the assets and creates a spiral. Now, if there was a bubble like Emma was talking about to begin with in these assets, it can get ugly, pre ugly pretty quickly. The job of a lender of last resort uh, is to serve as an institution that banks can go to in a crisis for funds when the depositors come to them in a, bump, in a run wanting to get their money back right away. Without, without one of these lenders of last resort in the 1800s, the US had cascades of bank failures, typically when assets became overvalued and then fell. So in, 1870, in, in 1873 panic, which was related to overinvestment in railroad, o, railroads and overbuilding in railroads, an innovation at the time, which was transforming the economy. 101 banks failed. In 1884, and in 1884 panic, 42 banks failed. And in an 1893 panic, which was again related to railroads, the same asset class as before, and also speculation in Latin America, 503 banks failed. It happened every decade, 1873, 1884, 1893. This is all chronicled in Kindleberger's book. The last straw was in 1907, when 73 bank fails, banks failed in another run. Now, in that case, there was a banker, not a bank, there was a banker named J.P. Morgan, uh, who all the banks turned to uh, for, uh, for short-term funding in the case of runs. Uh, 
And uh, this sparked a debate when we had a panic and it came down to one individual, J.P. Morgan, bailing out uh, dozens or hundreds of, of, of banks. Uh, it, it sparked a debate about whether the United States needed a lender of last resort of its own, just as many European countries had already adopted. So six years after this, the, Fed, the Federal Reserve was created in 1913 in response to that 1907 panic, direct response to the 1907 panic. We think of the Fed today as the institution that manages interest rates. We think of it as deciding whether rates should go up or down in response to the economy's ups and downs to cushion, to prevent recessions and prevent overheating. Uh, we also think of it as an institution that manages the money supply. Uh, people don't tend to carry paper money around these days, but if you pull out a $10 bill or a $20 bill and look across the top of it, you'll see it says Federal Reserve Note across the top of it. The Fed manages the money supply. But it was the job, it, it, it was this job to be ready to make sure that good banks didn't fail in a panic that was central to the Fed's founding. Among other things, it was equipped with a discount window where the Fed had the authority to lend out overnight funds, just like J.P. Morgan did, against the loans or securities that, bought, that banks brought to it as collateral. Now this brings me to the second writer that I wanted to talk about. Uh, his name was Walter Badgett. He was a British writer who lived from 1826 and, uh, to 1877. Fortunately, he's uh, the one who I didn't get a chance to meet. So, the UK was ahead of the United States in creating a lender of last resort in the Bank of England, uh, which has been around since 1694. Badgett was the editor-in-chief of The Economist magazine, which has also been around for a long time, and the author of the Lombard Street column, which still exists today. So observing financial crises that were so prominent in the 1800s, Badgett came up with a dictum for how central banks should behave in a crisis. He said, lend widely, against good collateral at a penalty rate. In other words, central banks should make credit available to anyone who came to them with sound assets to pledge as collateral. A house, a business, some basket of goods. But to make it a little tough for them to create a little bit of a disincentive by charging a slightly elevated interest rate. So this dictum, lend widely against good collateral at a penalty rate, would become the Fed's lodestar during the financial crisis from 2007 to 2009. Before talking about that crisis, I want to talk a little bit about the Great Depression. You'll see how it leads directly into what happened in the financial crisis. Many economists argue the Fed failed in the first great test after its founding. After an economic boom in the 1920s, it kept interest rates too high in the 1930s, and that hurt the economy. Unemployment was very high, over 20% by some measures. And instead of experiencing modest inflation, where consumer prices and wages are rising, the US experienced per a, a persistent long period of deflation, where prices and wages were falling. That was the Fed's management of the economy, but it also failed as a lender of last resort to keep banks going. I talked about hundreds of banks fall failing in the 1800s. 10,000 banks failed in the United States in the 1930s. One of the problems the Fed had, uh, had trouble with was following Badgett's dictum, which said to lend against good collateral. Because the US was in this period of deflation, it was hard to know what was good collateral in the first place, first place and what was bad collateral, because prices were falling so widely across the economy. So these failures bring me to the third writer that I want to talk about. And this person I did get a chance to meet, his name was Ben Bernanke. So before Bernanke went to Washington in 2002 to become a governor at the Fed, he was a professor at Princeton University where he studied the Fed in the Great Depression. And he wrote books and many, many papers detailing the Fed's mistakes during the Great Depression. This is fascinating to me. Imagine for a moment a historian here at Duke University who studied the Civil War. Let's say this historian is an expert in the strategies and tools of 19th century warfare the muskets and cannons, the charges of soldiers up hilltops and across grassy fields, and the people who led them. Imagine for a moment that this historian gets a job as an advisor at the Pentagon. She does such a good job as advisor that the president asks her to lead the Pentagon herself. Then a new civil war breaks out. She has to translate all of the lessons from that war, from the civil war, to a new modern battleground. 
with drones and laser-guided missiles instead of cannons and muskets. That's basically what happened at Ben Bernanke. He was a shy academic man who never got comfortable in Washington spotlight. His foot always fidgeted around in circles when I would go in to talk to him, and his lip would quiver when he had to speak publicly in front of Congress. But he was smart, and he was really gutsy. Bernanke became a Fed governor in 2002. By 2006, when he became the Fed's chairman, a real estate bubble was, real, was well advanced. By late 2007, he realized he had a crisis on his hands, and he needed to apply the lessons of Kindleberger and Badgett to a 21st century financial system, which looked nothing like it did in uh, the 1930s when he was writing about the Great Depression. The problem in this case didn't start out with banks themselves. It started out with financial institutions outside of the banking system, which the Fed itself didn't regulate or have a mandate to lend to in a crisis. I think you'll see the former CEO of Bear Stearns tonight. It included companies like Bear Stearns, Lehman Brothers, two investment banks, and AIG, an insurance company. They were all casualties of the crisis, but they didn't report directly to the Fed, and they didn't have a lender of last resort. They behaved like banks in really complex ways. Take Bear and Lehman Brothers. They got short-term funding, just like depositors in a bank that we talked about, George Bailey uh, in It's a Wonderful Life. And they got this funding through uh, lending arrangements with big institutions like money market mutual funds and commercial paper lenders. As part of this, they used uh, complicated funding mechanisms, one of which was called reverse repos in which they got a succession of one-day loans that they turned over every single day, and they used their security portfolios as collateral, these long-term security portfolios as collateral for their short-term loans, maturity transformation. They invested in real, in real estate interest, instruments like mortgage-backed securities and transacted in instruments few understood, like collateralized debt obligations and credit default swaps, the drones and laser-guided missiles of uh, the modern financial system. When the institutions that lent them money got scared about their investment holdings, they fled, just like depositors in a bank in an 1873 panic. The Fed had no formal arrangements with these institutions and had to make ad hoc decisions about who survived and who didn't and how. And they were very ad hoc decisions made on the fly. Ironically, near 100, nearly 100 years after the 1907 panic, Bear was bailed out by J.P. Morgan. This time it was the bank, not the person. Uh, and it was done with help from the Fed. Lehman Brothers, on the other hand, was allowed to fail. When markets went into upheaval, Bernanke realized he had a full-blown depression-like crisis on his hands, and he unleashed all of his cannons, lending widely to almost anyone against what the Fed deemed at the time good collateral. But it was hard to know because asset prices were falling again. Bernanke, the shy man, became perhaps the boldest financier in human history, determined not to allow a Great Depression happen on his own watch and knowing what he had to do to stop it. So AIG was bailed out just a couple of days after the Fed let Lehman Brothers fail. Then Bernanke created new facilities never used before to keep banks and other modern day lenders, like the money market funds that I talked about or the commercial paper markets, from getting caught in a downward asset spiral. He would send emails around to Fed staff with the word blue sky in the subject line, urging everyone to think creatively about innovative steps the Fed could take to cushion the financial, financial system. His model was FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who he credited with experimenting to get the US out of the Great Depression. Bernanke took other actions that were meant to keep the broader economy from collapsing. He pushed short-term interest rates to zero to encourage continued borrowing and lending. And he changed the way the Fed talked about these short-term interest rates, promising to keep them low until it was clear the economy got better, an effort to reassure uh, investors and businesses that he wasn't going to let things fall into a downward spiral. He also started a program known, as, known to the public as quantitative easing, in which the Fed bought trillions, trillions of dollars worth of treasury and mortgage bonds to push down long-term interest rates. Now, he innovated here, too, because the Bank of Japan years earlier had tried quantitative easing. But Bernanke had concluded that, he, that the Bank of Japan 
did it all wrong. And he actually lectured uh, Japanese central bankers about their mistake. The Bank of Japan focused on buying short-term securities. And, the, and Bernanke thought that would have no impact. He focused on buying longer-term securities, which he thought could push down long-term interest rates and induce more risk-taking in the financial system. He and uh, Hank Paulson, who was the Treasury Secretary at the time, also convinced Congress to approve a taxpayer-funded program to inject hundreds of billions of dollars of capital into the banking system, taxpayer-backed capital in this case, not central bank money, in return for government stakes in the banks. So in one uh, famous scene, Bernanke, Paulson, and the New York Fed president at the time, Tim Geithner, called the titans of Wall Street to Washington, Jamie Dimon, Lloyd Blankfein, and others. And they put them around a table, and they told them the United States government was about to become their most important shareholder, and they had no choice in the matter. So opposition to the Fed's actions, in an echo of the days of Thomas Jefferson and Mullien, was fierce. Republicans and Democrats both hated these bailouts. Republicans thought the government was intruding in free markets and banks should be allowed to fail, just as the liquidationists had argued back in the Great Depression. Democrats thought that rich guys on Wall Street were getting bailouts when the little guy was getting kicked out into the street and unemployment was taking off. I got death threats from some people who were so upset about, the way, about what the Fed was doing and how we were reporting about it at the Wall Street Journal. I can't imagine what Bernanke himself received. We live in very angry times, and this was a very angering moment for a lot of people. Bernanke made mistakes. He didn't see the bubble or the crisis coming, and the Fed failed to ensure that banks had enough capital to withstand a crisis. In many ways, though, he saved the day. Within a few months after the Fed intervened aggressively, banks stabilized, and economic expansion resumed by the middle of 2009. The bank bailout money was actually all paid back with a profit for the government. I remember walking out of my office the day AIG collapsed and had to be bailed out by the Fed, watching people in the street going about their business and thinking these poor people had no idea what was about to hit them. But a Great Depression was actually averted. Now, it didn't have to play out this way. Europe shows how it could have played out differently. Europe was less aggressive uh, fixing its banks after its own crisis, after our crisis spilled over into a global crisis, and it's gone through uh, a decade of economic disarray. Still, the scars of this crisis are still with us, and they're still with the Fed. The expansion uh, that started in 2009, which I guess is the uh, starting point for the conversation in this, con in this conference, uh, is still going today, and it's going to become the longest expansion uh, on record in the United States in July. But it's also been the slowest expansion on record. The unemployment rate is near its lowest level in almost a half a century, but it took a decade to get there, and millions of people suffered in the process. Federal debt is high and rising. The Fed has started raising interest rates again. In fact, there's a meeting going on today, which ends right at 2 o'clock. So right as we finish, you might want to check your phones. I won't, I won't be offended, because the Fed will be putting out its statement about what, it, uh, what its decision is today. Uh, just a little preview. They're not going to do anything. Um, <laughs> It's, it's raised interest rates uh, over the last few years up to around 2.5%, but the Fed's gotten worried in the last few months that it might be pushing them too far uh, because we've had this global economic slowdown, inflation isn't rising very much, markets have been very turbulent. And so the Fed is left with an interest rate at 2.5%, and that leaves it very little room to cut rates again if there's another crisis anytime soon. Its balance sheet is still swollen with all these bonds that it bought uh, during and after the crisis, and it's very slowly winding that down. So if there's another crisis, the Fed's likely to use some of these tools again, QE, zero interest rates. But it won't have as much room to act, uh, to, to maneuver with as it did in the past. And its powers as a lender of last resort have also been restrained by Congress because of all the backlash that it had after the, last, after the last crisis. For instance, it's not allowed anymore to lend to bail out an individual institution like AIG. So some people are a little worried that, uh, that if we do have another crisis and some too big to fail institution is on the brink that uh, we could have trouble resolving that problem. 
Kindleberger said, bubbles and panics were a hardy perennial. Today we wonder what new crisis might be lurking in our midst, whether we'll see it coming, and whether the Fed will be prepared to handle it. And with that, I'd like to thank you and take your questions. I'm not sure how much time we have. We, we have about 15 minutes. Thank you. Uh, I'm just curious with uh, there being such uh, less room on interest rates this time around, if we do come into a recession, do you see the, in your reporting the, the Fed being more willing to take on some new uh, unconventional measures like negative interest rates or helicopter drops or anything else to combat the next recession? Well, so uh, the European Central Bank has experimented with negative interest rates in the Bank of Japan has experimented with negative interest rates. So I think if there is a crisis, we could see, we could potentially see the Fed going there. Both the BOJ and the ECB have been reluctant uh, to push this too far. It causes problems, for instance, for banks managing uh, their interest rate margins. Uh, I think you know, what you're likely to see the Fed do is go back to some of the tools that it used in the last crisis. So, buying a large portfolio of uh, long-term treasury bonds. The Fed also uh, did, broke a lot of new ground in, in what's called forward guidance, how it describes what it's going to do as a way to manage a crisis. So the Fed uh, said in the last crisis that they would keep buying bonds until they saw inflation return to the 2% target until unemployment fell uh, to some lower level. And, uh, and that was meant to give uh, households, businesses, investors a sense of confidence that the Fed was on the job and wasn't going to stop until it was done. So I think you'll see them being very aggressive on forward guidance, too. Uh, this quite, you mentioned the term helicopter drop. So I'll just give a little bit of background on that. That was a term that Bernanke used when he was an academic to describe uh, well, it, it, it's a term that other economists have used, I think Milton Friedman, but Bernanke used it to describe what the Bank of Japan could do to deal with its long-term crisis. Basically, the Fed controls the money supply. Uh, you know, in really impractical terms, it could just drop money everywhere and um, use that to convince people that it's not going to allow deflation and to induce household spending and business investment. What they would do, in fact, they wouldn't do a helicopter drop, but you know what you, you could conceive of a central bank doing is financing a tax uh, a, t a massive national tax cut, buying uh, U.S. government bonds to fund a tax cut. I think things would have to be pretty bad in order to get there. But um, the the uh, the lesson we learned from the crisis is that central banks do have all these tools. There's the, there's this idea in economics called zero lower bound that once the interest rate gets to zero, there's nothing left for a central bank to do to fight a downturn. And I think what they learned in this crisis is that, is that there are things they can do after they get to zero, and they'll pull a lot of this stuff out the next time we get there. Yeah. Thank you for coming today. Um, so since 1977, the Fed's been under dual mandate, price stability and full employment. Going forward, what do you think the probability, given the political tenor of today, they had a third mandate, equality? Do you think that's something to think about for the future? It's a hard one. Uh, you know, there are only so many problems a central bank can solve, and, and its tool is basically money. Uh, it's managing the supply of money in the financial system, uh, and it's managing the cost of money, um, uh, which, is, which is the interest rate. And it's also making money available when it's no longer available to banks to keep lending. Uh, it can't manage something like discrimination, and it faces problems, and this is something that I've heard Fed officials talk about in the past. So, you know, one argument is that the Fed should let the economy run hot, run hot. That when the economy is going fast, grow, growing at a fast rate, 
or for a long period of time, we tend to see unemployment fall across, across races and across levels of educational attainment um, and across uh, income levels. And we're seeing that right now. We're seeing unemployment fall for African Americans, for, uh, for Latin Americans, and um, you know, in, in part because this is an, an economy that's running near full capacity. The problem is that when the economy overheats, if the Fed allows the economy to overheat and we go back into recession, those are all the groups that get hit first. That's exactly what we saw after the tech bubble burst in 2000. It's exactly what we saw after the last financial crisis. People with lower in, uh, education levels, uh, lower income levels, uh, different races tend to get hit the hardest. So it's hard, it would be hard to give the Fed an equality mandate um, because its effort to achieve it might actually make things worse for people uh, if, if it overdoes it and trying to push the economy too hard. It's really, I think a lot of people would argue that's something, if it's something that's, that's a, a priority for the American people, it's something that Congress has to manage uh, through taxpayer funding and not through a central bank. Hi, I was uh, wondering how you think the Federal Reserve should account for a uh, moral hazard when um, serving as a lender of last resort. Uh, so the question is, how will the how does the Fed account for moral hazard? You know, it, it, it's it's a perpetual perennial problem, and they, there's still debates going on today about why the Fed let Lehman Brothers collapse, and uh, some people would argue that it was trying to avoid this moral hazard problem that it had already kind of arranged the bailout of Bear Stearns through J.P. Morgan, and it didn't want to be sending a signal to all of Wall Street that anyone who uh, hit a wall was going to get bailed out by the Fed. That's one argument. What Bernanke has argued and others uh, who were involved in these discussions argued was that the Fed didn't have the legal authority to do it. It was able to bail out Bear Stearns because it had a willing buyer in uh, J.P. Morgan and lent J.P. Morgan money to do it, but it didn't have a willing buyer for Lehman Brothers, and the Fed didn't have capital that it could put into Lehman Brothers itself. Uh, but there is an argument that that's why the Fed let, let Lehman Brothers collapse. I think what we saw with, Be with, uh, with Bernanke's response after Lehman Brothers collapsed, and we saw runs happening uh, through money markets, uh, through commercial paper markets, throughout the financial system, his attitude was basically to hell with moral hazard. I'm not going to let a Great Depression happen on my hand. So that issue is still out there. I mean, it, it, we've managed to go a decade uh, of economic expansion without another bubble, I think because a lot of people were chastened by the last crisis. Um, but. Um, the problem is sure to reach us yet again. The, the Dodd-Frank law, which was mentioned in, um, in Emma's talk, uh, was written in a way that's supposed to allow uh, the government to close down big banks that fail in an orderly way without Fed money, but it hasn't been tested yet. Um, so this moral hazard question is going gonna, gonna to come back and be a challenge again, I think. Um, very interesting remarks. Um, uh, first, I guess I wanted to ask about your views or whether you'd followed much the uh, European Central Bank's leadership by Mario Draghi and his response to the sovereign debt crisis and then also Kuroda's uh, leading of the uh, Bank of Japan. Um, you know, I worry that the Fed has increased rates to 2.5%. They have a little bit of dry powder but maybe there's not much left dry powder in Europe. And in Japan, there's not much dry powder and the unemployment rate is 2.4%. Right. You know, if you're not gonna have dry powder when the unemployment rate's 2.4, you know, do you really, are you really being prudent? Yeah, I mean, I, I, think it's, I think it's a real problem, particularly for the ECB right now, because we, we've had a global economic slowdown uh, in the last six months associated with in part with the trade tensions between the US and China. 
And the Europe, European economy has really struggled in the face of it. It's caught in the crossfire between, uh, between the US and China. The, Europe came in uh, to 2018 looking like it was making a, experiencing a turnaround. It grew faster than the United States in 2017. Uh, and then it slowed down pretty sharply. We had uh, economic growth, well, the uh, economic output contract in the third quarter. Uh, Germany is very uh, tightly bound uh, to, to exports, and it's been hit by the slowdown in China. And as you say, interest rates are negative in, in Europe right now. The ECB doesn't really have a lot of room to stimulate if that region goes back into, uh, into recession. You know, I think as for Mario Draghi, it, one, one of the things I find interesting about this crisis period is um, all of the, no offense to Duke, but all of these folks studied at MIT together. So um, they studied under, under Kindleberger, uh, but Draghi and Bernanke were both students at MIT back in the 1970s. And I think Draghi, and they were close. They talked all the time during the financial crisis by phone. And I think Draghi was emboldened by the way Bernanke behaved. Uh, and he did a lot of things that I think um, emulated what Bernanke did. He, you know, he, he gave a famous speech in Jackson Hole, I think it was in Jackson Hole, where he said he would do whatever it takes to, to ensure that, um, that the European banking system didn't collapse and that inflation returned to the, to the 2% target. And that was kind of like the Fed's experiments with forward guidance, again, to reassure people that they weren't going to stop until they achieved their goal of getting inflation back to a 2% goal and getting uh, the economy back on on its footing, but Europe right now is the Fed's worst nightmare. It doesn't want to be caught in a situation where interest rates are very low, we go into a recession and they've got nothing to do. Yeah. I, I two more points if I could. Uh, one, um, first of all, you know, it seemed like Draghi with the ECB did managed to uh, save Greece, and Greece has turned around, and it seems like people don't talk about that. that I wouldn't have predicted that, and it seemed to happen. I don't know if you have any comment on that. Second one is the zero lower bound. I wonder if that's not going to be more binding in the U.S. than it is in Europe, because we're more free market. And, you know, if the interest rate goes to minus 50 basis points, let's say, and we have institutions like Vanguard Mutual Funds, Right. that can run the S&P 500 for five basis points or something like that, how much would it cost Vanguard to buy up land in Montana and store dollars for five basis points or two basis points? And right. uh, then how could rates get much below minus five basis points in the U.S.? Now, in Europe, they may say you can't do that. You can't store euros and get by with it, but I'm not sure they'd get by with that in the U.S. Uh, a couple points. First, on the, uh, the zero lower bound, I think that's a real issue that the Fed struggled with in the crisis. Uh, they were reluctant to push short-term interest rates all the way to zero uh, in that moment because they didn't want to squeeze the money market funds. They thought that if they did that, it would put the money market funds out of business. Uh, and it's such an important um, component of the way, uh, the, the way finance is conducted in the United States, they just they didn't want to go there. And so they put, I think, probably a little bit more emphasis on uh, forward guidance and bond buying. So as for Greece, yeah, I mean, we have seen a good turnaround in a number of European economies, but they're not out of the woods. The big worry right now is Italy. Uh, so uh, Italy is sitting on a lot of government debt, um, and it, the spreads on its... Um, its cost of borrowing are wider than many other countries, and there are a lot of worries that Italy could be the next country to, to hit a wall and worries about how it would respond to that. There's always the risk in Europe that some country hits a wall and decides to leave the, the, Euro, the Euro system, and that spreads uh, turmoil around, around the region. Okay, I think we're done. Thank you. <laughs>